Let's take our Bibles at this time and turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. With this sermon that has to do with sowing and reaping, we would conclude uh, basically a series on the fruit of the Spirit that's mentioned in Galatians chapter 5. And here we would conclude this with a fitting application, which is the concluding exhortation of the apostle in the entire epistle. So we read Galatians 6, and we'll read the first 10 verses And our text will be verses 7 through 10. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. And then our text, do not be deceived or led astray. God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in doing a due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Thus far, we read God's holy word. My text, as I mentioned, is a concluding exhortation of the apostle of this entire epistle. And the apostle really here in this concluding exhortation, which begins, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, and then in which he mentions the law of sowing and reaping, He's continuing exhortations that he has begun after he's expounded the gospel when he has been exhorting the Galatians with regard to their apostasy from the gospel. And so he marvels that they had so soon been moved from him who called them from the gospel of grace even to the gospel, which is no gospel, of works. And the Judaizers were bewitching the Galatians, the Christians even, into thinking that in addition to Christ and free and sovereign grace, there needed to be the multiplication, really, of their own works to assure that they would, in the end, be saved. So the apostle has been saying all along, believe not the Judaizers, the mixers of grace and works, the synergists, as we would say today uh, in our theological parlance, who say that God works and also salvation depends on what we do. Paul says, whoever brings such a gospel or message, which is no gospel, Let him be cursed and believe the truth that I have told you, that God alone saves sinners through Christ Jesus alone and through believing in him alone. There is no merit that we can have with God, and it is foolish to believe something that is the lie with regard to our merit. That, in the first place, is why the apostle is saying, do not be deceived. He is, in our text, reminding the congregation at Galatia, and there were different ones, the churches of Galatia, not to be led astray. The truth has its effect, and the lie has its effect. So do not be led astray or deceived by the lie, but believe the truth. 
In addition, the apostle has, in the last chapter and a half especially, been exhorting the congregation to a proper response to the truth, believing the truth is, is vital. It's the principal thing. Also responding to the truth in a good way, something that is an adornment to the truth and that shows that you really believe the truth. That is vital. The apostle Paul would warn them, do not be deceived with regard to a certain lifestyle which says that you believe in grace and now you can live like the devil. You can do whatever you want because after all, if you're saved freely and you're kept by God alone, nothing can get you away from God's love, then why not have your cake and eat it too? Have the gospel, call yourself a Christian, and be the ones who, who are the greatest partiers on Friday night. So the apostle is warning against that kind of loose living. He says, no, you who are Christ have crucified the flesh, and you are to bear the fruit of the Spirit. That's been our series of sermons hitherto. And now even, strikingly, the apostle says and grounds this whole business, all of these exhortations with regard to the truth and to the proper response to the truth, he grounds it all in the inviolable law of sowing and reaping. Notice here in our text, the apostle Paul says... Be not deceived, God is not mocked. And what he's doing is making a conclusion here. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. Let's put it this way. If you believe a certain doctrine that's false, if you are going to believe that, you're sowing. You're believing a lie, and you're going to reap that lie also. If you're living a certain lifestyle, if you're sowing to the flesh, the apostle says, doesn't matter if you believe in the gospel of grace, you will reap what you sow. That's how important the apostle says is our reaction to the gospel that he's been preaching. And that I want to commend to your attention as well is how important it is that you react to the gospel preaching of the truth of the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ and the truthful and holy response that we be fruitful in godliness and in holiness. Whatever a man sows, that he shall reap. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. So let's consider sowing and reaping in gardens and in wastelands. After all, we'll see, this text is really one grand exhortation with regard to the sowing and reaping of God's people, and we need to consider the whole here to um, see exactly what the apostles bring. But let's consider that we are to sow and to reap believingly, and then secondly, in love, and finally, with great hope. First of all, we have to deal with this principle that the apostle has, is bringing forth here about sowing and reaping. Do not be deceived, he says. Don't be led astray. Know the truth of this. God is not mocked. He is the one who has established a law. Whatever a man sows, that he also will reap. For he who sows to his flesh, he goes on, will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit, will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now what the apostle is doing here is citing well-known law in agriculture, in farming. And children, perhaps you'll be gardening this spring, and you'll see this too. It will be exactly as the Bible says here. We can trust our Bibles as it informs us on the principles of agriculture and farming. Maybe you're planting grass. Well, the principle is when you plant something, whatever you plant, you'll get more of that same thing. If you plant corn, you're going to get wheat. No, 
You're going to get an apple tree if you plant corn seed? No, you're going to get corn, aren't you? If you plant an apple seed, are you going to get a pear tree? No. Are you going to get thorns? Are you going to get a rose bush? No, you're going to get an apple tree out of that apple seed, if God willing, everything works out well. But the seed contains the seed of an apple tree or of a corn plant or of um, sugar beets or whatever you're planting. There is a law for agriculture here, and everyone knows that. God has given in his creation this law. When he made plants, these shall produce their own kind. And so he's drawing upon the basics of the knowledge of the people of creation and and providence. That's how God provides for things. And it's a natural law as well with regard to all sorts of things in this life. If you work, you eat. If you don't work, if you're lazy, you're you're not going to have anything to eat, uh, God willing. But that's the law of consequences with regard to the things that you do. And this concerns even the moral realm, and that's what the apostle is speaking of here. If you sow to the flesh, the apostle says, whatever you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Now, what's he talking about here? First of all, what about this sowing to the flesh? What the apostle is alluding to here is a biblical concept of which he's spoken in Galatians and in other places. The the truth of the nature of Adam in all of us. He's talking here about believers and in unbelievers as well. And it just so happens that all the unbelievers are is flesh. They're just the old man in dead in sins. But believers have this old man too. The fact is, if you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. What does that mean? Well, the idea is pretty clear. It means if you do something that is sinful because the flesh is sinful, if you're going to sow in that field of sin, you're going to get more sin because of it. And not only that, you're going to get the the consequences of sin, which the apostle says is corruption. Now, that could mean something that perishes, or it could mean even death itself, for corruption is a part of death. Whatever he means, he means certainly this. When you are sinning, when, when you are doing things that arise out of your, of your sinful nature, that will have the consequences. You will reap the fruit of sin in your life and others as well who are affected by what you're doing. The sowing is what you do. The sowing is what you say. The sowing is what you think. The sowing is, is your desires. It all has consequences, the apostle says. Whatever you sow, you also shall, re- shall reap. And if you sow of the flesh, if you're thinking sinful thoughts, this will have consequences, maybe even in deeds. If you sow of the Spirit, this will have consequences, even everlasting life. But that in the first place, do you see this? This is an inviolable and unbreakable principle. It's the law of consequence, the law of retribution, as it were, so that there is this result that happens because of evil. Now, we know that this is not just a pagan thing, that things have consequences. No, God is in the mix, isn't he? He's the God who judges, and who judges according to his law, which is the standard. And if you're sowing to the flesh, you're breaking the law of God. You're doing sinful things. And so God, who is holy, he visits iniquity with the judgments of death and corruption and all the consequences that have been ever since the fall. So that's the the case here. This is the law that the apostle is speaking of. But then he says, he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. The idea here is if you 
do a, uh, a spiritual deed if you're sowing to the Spirit, into the Spirit, and that's the idea of the preposition there, if you're doing something with a view to what pleases the Spirit, you will of that same Spirit have a harvest. And the harvest, the Apostle says here, will be the reaping of everlasting life. Now that, of course, is an allusion to heaven. Those who walk in the way of farming and doing good deeds and thinking good thoughts and desiring good things, this is the way of everlasting life. The Bible calls it the holy way, the way to heaven, and without this holiness, no one shall see the Lord. No one shall know everlasting life. Even in this life, however, there are consequences to the good deeds that we sow. If we sow to the Spirit or to please the Spirit, to please God who is over us and in us, there will be the consequences of blessedness and the things that pertain to fellowship with God. And so this is the law, and I'm just briefly outlining this. You do evil, there's consequences to what you do. You do good, and there's consequences to what you do on the good side. And the consequences are startling for their contrast, aren't they? Those who do evil, they die, they perish, they ultimately go to hell, if that's all they do in this life. Those who do good, who sow with a view to pleasing the Spirit of Christ, they reap everlasting life. They go to heaven. Now, that is the law here that the apostle is setting forth here. And he's doing this to impress upon believers the importance of their true response to everything he's been saying. He's doing this to impress upon believers to react well. He wants us to believe, who believe in the gospel of grace to react well and not to think that reacting poorly, maybe not really caring about this Judaizing thing, and we can kind of believe that, or maybe not really caring about this godliness thing and bearing the fruits of the Spirit. He's doing that to those who do not take seriously the calling of the apostle of God and of God himself to believe wholeheartedly in grace and to live wholeheartedly with all that is within you unto the glory of God. Now I ask the question right now, how are you responding to the gospel of grace? The Apostle Paul says, do not be deceived. Don't be led astray either by those who would bring in some kind of works righteousness into the preaching or by the notion that you can just do whatever you want and it doesn't matter. He's warning everyone in the congregation as well. He has already upbraided the, the Galatians for being bewitched. Who has bewitched you? He's berated the congregation as well for being fools. Now imagine if your pastor said that. How would you receive that if I called you, oh, foolish Foolish, sovereign grace folks, who has bewitched you that you should believe another gospel? Sometimes that needs to be said. Thankfully, not many of us are being so fooled with regard to the doctrines of grace that the apostle was impressing upon the people. But I fear that there's many of us who subtly and not so subtly can think, well, what we do is not so important. The Apostle Paul says it has eternal consequences. It has temporal consequences. What you sow, you believers, you Christians, you will reap. You will reap. If you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. It will hurt you. It will hurt your marriage. It will hurt the congregation if instead of praying when you should be praying, you're dozing off in front of the, of the tube. If we're not taking seriously our calling, 
the apostle says, we're going to be hurting to the degree that we take lightly the doctrines of grace. And so the question has to come to us because he says, there's this danger of deception and of a mockery of God's gospel in our own behavior. The apostle says that to a congregation of the first century. The good shepherd would say that to us this evening. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man sows, he will also reap. For he sows to his flesh, he who lives with a view to pleasing his own appetites, will of the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to the Spirit to please God, will of that same Spirit reap everlasting life. Amazing. Let me try to say this in a different way here. <clears throat> God in his mercy has visited earth. That's what Christmas is all about. And pretty soon we see God in his mercy, according to our church calendar, has visited earth and in his son paid for every one of our sins. He did that on the cross, didn't he? He paid for every one of our sins. Did God in Jesus Christ reveal? And now, from heaven, Jesus, you see, who died on the cross, is risen. From heaven, he pours out the Spirit, and that redemption that was accomplished then and there is applied here and now. And where there was wasteland, there's God in the wasteland making gardens. Not everywhere. And it doesn't happen except there be grace. But among the ones for whom Jesus died, garden after garden after garden is being planted by God. Elsewhere, all people do is they sow to the flesh because that's all they are, is flesh. Human beings born in Adam are just flesh. They're just this nature. They have a soul, but I mean there's a principle in them that all it wants to do is please self. Theirs are not gardens. Theirs are wastelands. They're, they're businesses, their homes, their hearts. And it's a terrible, terrible thing to be a wasteland or a part of the vanity of this world. And though it may be that there seems to be good fruit, humanitarian kindness and some sort of joy and, and things that are done for the so-called good of humanity, nevertheless, if the spirit is in, not in the heart, all the so-called good works of human beings are to the praise of human kind and not to the praise of God and they're not done in faith and they are done denying the need of Jesus because after all if you do good and if you're pleasing to men and you're pleasing to God himself without Jesus well you don't need Jesus not the Jesus of the cross this was at stake you see at the churches of Galatia, in the very first century, the gospel of God in the wasteland making gardens, and God having to do this because no one could rise up to God, and no one could plant anything. And at the end of the day, God would say, My, what a great orchard you made for me. Galatia needed to be reconfirmed in just Jesus. And the church needs to be reconfirmed in that too. Because what happens is 
by his grace, God makes of us a garden. And though there's flesh, and though there's consequences for reaping or for sowing to the flesh in our sinful deeds, and when the young people think they can sow their wild oats, and when the older people think they can just relax and just be entertained because they put in their 50 years in the service of the king, and it happens, it's a terrible blight upon the gospel of grace. But what happens, people of God, is that God has made us a garden and he's given us of his spirit to bear fruit. And we sow to the spirit. This is the marvel of grace. And as I encourage you this morning, we see it here. There's a garden here and it's growing. Maybe you don't see it, but soul by soul, family by family, there's growth and there's fruit and there's God in the midst and he's planting things and he's cultivating and he's pruning and yet there's this wonderful, wonderful fruition of his own work. Through the ministry of the gospel in answer to your prayers as you are here not only, but as you're here in soul and spirit and as, well, as you demonstrate this, and this is my second point, believing this law, not only of retribution, but of grace, this rule by which we now live, we would demonstrate in our loving deeds, as the apostle describes in our text, just what it is to sow to the Spirit. Verse 9, verse 10. Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we lo not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, he says, let's do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. I find here a connection between the law of sowing and reaping, and especially here with the emphasis on sowing to the Spirit, on doing good to all and especially to the household of faith. That's it. What is it to sow to the Spirit? You want to say, Reverend Dick, how do I live to please the Spirit of Christ within, and therefore Christ above and God the Father? How do I live that way? Well, the Bible says do good. And don't grow weary in doing good. Do good. And do good to the household of faith especially, but also to all men. That's what he's saying here. Now, what is doing good? Well, doing good is, as our catechism says, it's doing things out of faith. And then what? Doing them according to the standard of God's perfection, the law. And then doing things according to the, the, or to the praise of God. That's what good truly is. It's what it is, whether you're playing the guitar or playing the piano or singing or worshiping or mothering or fathering or being a worker here and being on the playground over there, being in school, whatever it is, you're doing good if you do this of faith and you do this according to holiness and you do this to the praise of God. That's what the apostle is urging us on to do here. This is sowing to the Spirit. And for the blessedness of the congregation that does this, this is for the everlasting life known and tasted and seen in our own midst. But let me start, first of all, the apostle says, reminds us that in this doing good and, and concerned about our gardens and how they're growing, he says, remember, do good to all, verse 10, as you have opportunity. Do good to all. Now, that would be to the neighbor, to any neighbor there is in your life. That would be to the unbelieving neighbor. The believing neighbor doesn't make any difference. It would be to all, because the apostle says, do good to all. Show the kind of person you are. Show the kind of three persons that God is as you do good to people in the name of that triune God. You do that? That's hard, isn't it? When you cannot expect anything except perhaps mockery, the apostle saying you do good to all. You're not here. You're not just circling the wagons. You are witnesses in this world, though not of it. 
And so you come across neighbors, you come across people at the checkout counter, you work with them, you rub shoulders with them in the office and so on. You do good to them. Hi, how do you do that? Well, you tell them of Jesus, of course. You're seeking the salvation of their soul. As you have opportunity, you tell them of Jesus and you seek the salvation of their soul. Meantime, when there's not always opportunity, you work hard. You obey your employer. You respect the employer. You are kind to one who loses a loved one and you, you send your sympathies to them and so on. This is how we witness and how we do good to all men. But especially the apostle says, let us do good especially to those who are of the household of faith. And you see what Paul is saying here is that there's a priority. Now, this may sound unbiblical, but it's eminently biblical. It's right here in the Bible. Do good especially to the church. And that doesn't mean the church over there. It means the church here, where you are. It means you do good to the congregation of your own home and then the congregation where you worship Lord's Day after Lord's Day, the local congregation. You see, it's easy to love everybody else, isn't it? And not so easy to love the one right next to you or the one over there, the one over there or whatever, or maybe especially sometimes the one on the pulpit. But God has given us each other as a family. And you do good to one another in the congregation. This is how you learn what it is to love those who are sometimes mean and nasty, who don't love you back as you'd like them to, who maybe rub you the wrong way, who look differently than you want, who have different backgrounds, different nationalities, hard to pronounce their name, whatever it is. But you do good, he says, to the household of faith right where you're at, and to others, of course, in the household of faith. But you see, there's a priority. Why? Because, dare I say this, with God, there's a priority. God loves his bride. Now he's in the saving of souls business, has from, been from eternity, chosen all of his own, and he's out there working and saving his own. When they're saved, he loves them as the bride and they are his precious people. You are his precious people, beloved. He loves you as the apple of his eye. And he loves you to love her as well, to pray for her, to do good to her and not to be weary in praying and doing good for her. Now, a couple of things or more I want to emphasize here in this final point of this second point about loving loving, and in that way showing that we are sowing to the Spirit. The focus has to be <clears throat> in our sowing to the Spirit and doing good in the congregation. The focus has to be the Word of God. Has to be. The Apostle Paul has been speaking to the Galatians of the Word of God. That's his first three chapters or so. The gospel, the truth. We are nothing here, people of God, if we are not a household of the truth. We might as well go home. We're nothing here if we're not a totally biblical congregation, and that would mean, as we uh, confess it, a reformed congregation. I'll put it this way. We are nothing if we believe salvation is by grace and works. That's exactly what the apostle is saying. But do you realize that's exactly what the Roman Catholic Church says? Salvation is by grace and works. Paul would call them anathema. They call us anathema. We need to understand the preciousness of the gospel that we have so that we're unashamed of the grace of God. We would not say that it's a good thing to be Arminian and then you can be a nice Christian and an uncompromised Christian to be Arminian. You know what the fathers at Dort said of the Arminians? They deposed them all at the Synod of Dort in 1618-19. They, 
They thought that that was a great compromise that people were saying, but you need to accept Jesus, and there's this will that's involved, and it's, that's vital, and Christ died for everybody after all. They used to think that the gospel of the power of the cross was important. And now in our niceness, we'll include everybody where the apostle would say, that's being bewitched to compromise grace. To say, it's Jesus and you that get yourself saved. Maybe Jesus and you're reaping as if, or, or you're sowing as if this was a, something on which your salvation depended. And that's not what I'm saying, nor what the apostle's saying, though it's so vital. Where are we with this? Note how the apostle here, in verse 6, just before our text says, Let him who is taught, let him who is taught the word, share in all good things with him who teaches. Now this can be sort of an embarrassment for a preacher to preach, but do you know what it's saying here? Paul is saying, if you're taught by the gospel, make sure you support the one who teaches you. In other words, there is the teaching here that ministers ought to be supported. That's what the text says. Why does he say that? Well, I believe, though there's some difference of opinion on this, certainly he's saying the word is important. Learning the word is important, and promoting the gospel ministry is important. Now, all I want to say is that, is this. Because it's true, because I want you to be blessed and to share with me of your material things, because I don't go out and swing a hammer for a living. All I want is air to breathe and soup for dinner. That's it. That's it. I don't care if I all but starve, though I'd have you feed my family better than I so long as you're fed the Word of God. That's all I'm about here. I really, frankly, don't care. Except you're fed the truth, and you believe it, and you bear fruit. That's all. That's all. I would, however, covet your prayers so that the gospel gets out. I would, however, as a gospel ministry, remind you that I'm bringing precious seed here, the seed of the Word of God, and that Jesus Himself is your shepherd, and He loves you. And I want so much that you bear fruit for His sake. And this goes hand in hand with the gospel ministry. And so, as much as I need breath to preach and a heart and a little bit of soup in the stomach, provide that, will you? God calls you to do that for God's sake for the truth's sake. Just do that. And bear all kinds of other fruit for his praise. Just do that. The ministry of the word is so important. That's what the apostle's been saying here. We're nothing without the truth that sets us free. The spirit. You say you got the spirit? If you do not have the word, I smite your spirit on the snout, Luther would say to the crazies who thought Reformation was leaving the word altogether as they were leaving the church and going in a commune somewhere. The spirit and the word go together. Sowing to the spirit is sowing to the word and with the word of God. You need the word of God and faith that comes by hearing the word of God. And how shall the word of God be heard and believed, except there be a preacher, and you send the preacher, and you support the preacher, and you pray for the preacher, and you bear good fruit, and you act like a congregation that's from heaven. That's the point of the apostle here, first of all. That's why the apostle in Psalm 126, which was our call to worship, not the apostle, the psalmist, it says, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. There's 
a minister bearing seed. Seed is so important. So preaching. But secondly, if we would sow to the Spirit, we must be passionate. Passionate in whatever form of doing good we have. Preaching, for example, must be done with weeping. Note here in Psalm 126, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You understand what this sowing business is all about? You who've been made a garden of the Lord, you who have the amazing capabilities because God is with you of sowing not to the flesh, but of sowing to the Spirit. Do you realize? Do you realize that weeping we must do when there's so little fruit in our own lives and upon the preaching and in earnest desire that people would be saved? We weep as Jesus wept over Jerusalem. We weep and sinners go lost and they hear Sunday after Sunday the word of God and they bear no fruit. And we weep when in our own lives we have such a small beginning of the new obedience and it doesn't seem to be getting any bigger and all that we see is the weeds And we know the inner weeds and we know the the problems of our thinking and of our desires and we're in a straight betwixt two between heaven and earth and earth seems to win in all of our desires that we say we have for heaven. So it's about crying and passion, you see. The preacher may not be a stone, though he brings the rock of the gospel and would lead people to the rock that's higher than we. There must be passion for sinners and for the saved. To speak of the compassion of Jesus Christ himself, who sowed even this earth with his blood. It is a very difficult thing to sow in this earth, isn't it? Very difficult for all of us. Even though we have these wonderful gardens, there's a beginning. Even though there's this wonderful Spirit who leads us along and we have the promises of God. Very tiring, isn't it? Our text anticipates the wearisomeness of it all. Let's not grow weary, the apostle says, in doing good. In due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart or grow faint. He knows Striking the apostle was such an example of of almost superhuman stamina. He's he's saying of himself, you know, we're oppressed on every side, and um, there's all kinds of lions and bears in his life, and all kinds of wolves who would undermine his ministry. And yet he says, we faint not, faint not. He urges the elders of Ephesus when he says goodbye to them to stay strong. As I would urge the elders of Sovereign Grace to stay strong. Keep on pressing on like you are and increasingly. And we're reminded here that all of us need to take the admonition to heart, not to lose heart, because doing good for God's sake not for notoriety's sake, sowing to the spirit and not to the flesh. It doesn't always produce the harvest you want, when you want it, and how you want it to grow. It doesn't, does it? You ever have that? 
when you're, you're demanding an apology from somebody and you get a little bit, yeah, okay, and you're pretty sure it's not a sincere apology. But that's all you get. You have to deal with it. Sure, you've had that in your life. You ever sow this and that and the other thing and you raise your child in a certain way and by and by they find you find that they're going astray. They're doing something you didn't teach them. Maybe somebody else taught them. And you're wondering, what was the use? You can have that. Or you spend money on this and that project and it flops. What, what's the use of this? It was for the cause of missions here. And, and the guy turned out to be unfaithful to his calling and to his wife. And I gave to that. And on and on. It seems so vain, doesn't it? You pray about this and that and the other thing. And you pray to be rid of a habit. And it doesn't seem that the Lord is answering. You don't have the strength to do this anymore. And you preach and you preach. And today there's 50 people in the congregation. Tomorrow, next week, there's 30. What are you doing wrong? Not passionate enough? Not short enough? Your sermons? Not clear enough? You know, Monday mornings are often the wettest mornings for me. I weep the most because I know, I know the weaknesses of my sermons and of myself more than you do. And I weep and I say, Lord, use even the feeblest of efforts May it be that if they know nothing else, they don't remember that, that the wonderful way I put that, at least they know Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Tell me you know Jesus, will you? Tell me it in your life. I know Christ crucified, and I don't want to live for anyone else. And why would I sow to my flesh? Why would I do that? When he's come in the flesh and he's sowed and filled this earth with his blood and he's died for my sins, then I might not longer live in them. And there's no condemnation because he was condemned of God for me. Galatians, don't be bewitched. Sovereign Gracians, don't be bewitched by another gospel. And don't be lured by the siren call of the world just to live, to have fun. You're here to serve. Serve Christ. Even if it gets you crucified, isn't he worth it? That's the question that it comes down to. Isn't Jesus worth your living and you're dying for him, isn't he? Children, young people, single people, moms and dads, married couples, doesn't matter who you are. Is Jesus worth everything to you? How does your garden grow? May you on behalf of God, be found sowing to the Spirit and reaping life everlasting. Amen. Lord God, we pray you would give us ears to listen and faith to go forth sowing to the Spirit we want to please you, Lord. Oh, God. We pray that you would bless us. We don't want to be compromised anymore. 
lackluster, careless anymore, because you love us and we love you. Hear our prayer, Lord. For Jesus' sake, amen.